Good evening and welcome to the medical student webinar that is held as a collaboration between the American Medical Women's Association and the Ruth Jackson Orthopedic Society. We'd like to extend a special thank you to AOFAS for allowing us to utilize their webinar platform to produce this series. I'd like to run through a quick few housekeeping items before we kick off tonight's meeting. Please make sure your speakers are turned on and that the volume is turned up. For technical assistance, you can reference the help tab at any time. If you have any technical difficulties, your best bet is to close all your browsers and log back in the same way you did the first time. If you experience any buffering issues, please refresh your browser. We are recording this webinar tonight and will provide the recording online in approximately a week. To download some additional webinar materials from today's presenters, click on the handout tab on the right side of your screen. We'll have 20 minutes at the end of the webinar for questions. You are encouraged to ask questions of our presenters. To send the question to the panelists, click on the question mark icon at the bottom right of your navigation column. I would now like to turn the program over to our first moderator, Dr. Kim Templeton, to begin. Dr. Templeton? Thank you very much. Uh, I too would like to thank AMWA and RJOS for co-sponsoring this, this webinar this evening, which will actually be the first in a series of webinars where we're trying to reach out to female medical students who are interested in careers in orthopedic surgery. So I'd like to welcome all of the students who have taken time to be on the webinar this evening. Um, I'm Kim Templeton. I'm the Orthopedic Surgery Residency Program Director at the University of Kansas in Kansas City and honored to be a past president of both AMWA and RJOS. And our next, uh, next faculty, Dr. Laporte. Uh, thank you, Dr. Templeton. On behalf of RJOS, I'd like to welcome and thank all of you uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, we're very excited to have over 200 uh, registrants for the webinar. Um, you've all made the excellent decision uh, that orthopedics is a great field and career. Uh, we're very privileged to have an outstanding group of faculty uh, tonight for this first webinar, and we look forward uh, to talking with all of you. So I'm Dawn Laporte. I am the residency program director at Johns Hopkins and a hand surgeon, and I'd like to um, ask uh, Dr. Bradford to next introduce herself. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. 200. That is incredibly exciting. Um, my name is Dr. Letitia Bradford. I am a general orthopedic surgeon, and I um, actually currently practice locum tenens work mostly. So I'm all over the country right now. I'm in Mississippi, actually. And I am also the executive director of Nth Dimension. So hopefully some of my students are here as well. Welcome, everybody. We look forward to a, uh, an exciting evening. Dr. Holt. My name is Ginger Holt. I am the Orthopedic Residency Program Director at Vanderbilt Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Am I supposed to give my 30-minute spiel or 30-second spiel, or is that it? We'll do we'll do that later. <laughs> well, that's me. Okay. You're muted, Dr. Kogan. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Oh, there she is. She's back. 
This is part of what we'll be discussing later on this evening about getting ready for virtual interviews. Uh, technology can be challenging. <laughs> so we want to make sure we know how it works. Do we want to keep it rolling? Yes, let's move on. Suleiman, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Sure. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Linda Suleiman. I am a joint replacement surgeon at Northwestern. I'm of diversity and inclusion for graduate medical education at Northwestern, as well as the assistant dean of medical education. I am very excited to be here. Um, many of my mentors are on this call today that I talk to all the time. Um, so we want to make sure that we get to know you um, even after this webinar and we'll share our email addresses later on. Um, but we really want to make this an opportunity um, for you all to ask us questions, I'll give you information on the wonderful specialty of orthopedics. And until Dr. Kogan can come in, she is the uh, residency program director at Rush University in Chicago. She'll be talking with us a little later, but at least we want, wanted to introduce her. So Ginger, I think I think you are first up. So I want to remind you guys too, we, we got together and put this together to make this a really safe space for you guys to be able to ask any question uh, that you want. So there's no uh, silly question and um, please feel free to ask. Uh, I was tasked with sort of talking about how to pick a program and that's really uh, hopefully or likely by this point you've decided that you want to do orthopedic surgery, but the next step then is uh, how do you pick a program? I do think today that the ACGME is a great equalizer. Uh, there used to be significant disparity between programs, but today we, we have requirements that are pretty standardized. And I really feel like people get a good orthopedic education in this country. There are nuances and things that may make training better for you. And that's how picking a program becomes important. I usually talk about the three L's of choosing an orthopedic residency program, location, learning style, and like. Finding people like you or finding your wolf pack. For location, 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 it's not just important for where you pick your house, but it's picking your uh, program region. So where in the country uh, you may want to go. I usually tell people to divide the country in quartiles, north, uh, northeast, north, uh, west, North, uh, southeast, southwest, um, looking across the country, you may pick a place that just doesn't suit you. The southeast may not be the right region for you. Uh, the northwest may be too far away from family. So the first thing is looking at geography, and you can pretty quickly narrow down places that may not interest you just based on geography. I do think today that it is more about lifestyle and less about culture. Uh, long ago, when I was applying to programs, um, there were uh, programs in regions that just weren't what female friendly and mm -hmm. we knew to cross them off the list. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it is really important and I tell female applicants that women more than men and we've done a study looking at this, women need a support system, especially single women and women rely on a support system and prefer a support system outside of the hospital as opposed to men. So location for you may keep you close to family, friends, or that support system that's gonna be really important for you during a really difficult time in life, which a busy time, which is residency training. So the second L is learning style. And I ask medical students to first learn your own learning style because you need to know how you learn and figure out how a program teaches. Um, you can go online and do tests that evaluate whether you're an auditory learner, a visual learner, a tactile learner, and that may help separate some program differences for you. Again, programs are pretty similar, and um, this is reinforced to me now as I go through Instagram and look at programs and look, uh, look to see we're, we're all pretty similar. But what separates us? Well, how you learn uh, could really be important as to what program you end up in. The type of conference, um, if you are a tactile learner and someone who really needs to be interactive, asking questions of the residents, what type of conferences do you have? What do they consist of? Who gives the conference? Are there opportunities for me to teach a conference? Maybe teaching is, is a very important way for you to learn. And so being able to be uh, engaged and be a part of that process could really be important as to your learning style. Is the skills uh, process one month? 
that's bundled in, in a really intense session, it may really cater to your style of learning. You may prefer that the skills sessions be broken up and that every Friday uh, you go into a skills lab and get to learn and do some skills education. So that can be something that can differentiate a program. Case volume. Perhaps you're a person who likes to dig really deep into a smaller number of cases as opposed to seeing many, many cases coming your way and learning based on volume. So you can pretty easily get that number uh, just by asking case volumes, surgical cases, close reduction cases, clinic volumes, and that sort of thing. I do think it's important when you're figuring out a program to be able to ask, uh, wh wh what does a case volume mean? What do you do in the case? How does this, um, how does this, how do you really interact in a case? And tell me about one of your favorite cases and what your role was and what you did. Night float is a process um, that can separate programs. Uh, some people really like night float because they're a little bit isolated. They're a little bit to themselves. They're able to learn on their own. There's a little bit more independent time for that. I'm personally not a fan of night float. Uh, and so that would have been something for me to look at a program and say, I don't want a program that does that, but it very well may cater to you. How much interaction is there for teaching? Do you learn from peers? Do your peers raise you up to learn? Uh, and is that something really important to you? And you can get that by talking to the residents in the program uh, and really finding out how much they teach or how much they are taught to teach. Campus layout. Is the campus closed? Our, personally at Vanderbilt, our campus is in one location. So we have conference together every morning. That may really appeal to some people. It may not. Some people may really prefer being at a facility on their own, sort of being one-on-one -on -one with an attending uh, throughout a, a, um, an entire rotation. So you have to figure out if that's going to be the type of learning style that's important for you. Is early autonomy important for you? Or are you a person who would really like to ramp up, get a lot of skills under your belt and feel really good before you go into a case as opposed to sort of being put in early, having to figure things out on your own <clears throat> and, and sort of be, you know, uh, uh, quizzed a lot and, and asked questions to get, to get uh, uh, some education. And once you've really assessed your learning style and how a program teaches, I think the most important thing, because the ACGME uh, really makes us quite similar, is really finding people who are like you, finding your wolf pack, if you will. And I think that um, if education is fairly similar across the board, you should really be happy, you should be comfortable, you should be in an environment that, that really fosters your education. And, and a lot of that comes from just the comfort level of the people around you, uh, and, and, and your teachers and the attendings that you're going to be with. This takes a lot of interaction, and, and, and a lot of this is what is lost this year with the virtual interviews. You guys may be good uh, at, at doing this through social media and really figuring programs out. One helpful thing is really talking with the program coordinator at a program. They can give you a lot of information about the program um, that you may not get otherwise. They can also clue you in on people who are former residents of the program, who may be in your region, who may be at the hospital uh, where you are or in, in the area that you could talk to about that program. Meeting those people, meeting graduates of the program that you, you may be able to do regionally can give you a much better feel for the program, what the program is like, and then asking some specific questions. You know, what was your lowest point in residency and how did you get out of it? What's one word that you would use to describe your residency and give me an example of what that is? What happens if you really get in trouble on call and, and what can you really do to get out of that? So I, I really think following the three L's, location, learning style, and like, can really focus you down on where you really push to look at programs. When we ask you guys for questions, uh, getting ready for this, a lot of people ask the question, how do I uh, uh, reach out to programs? What advice can I get for standing out. And I think first you have to find a program or two or five that really interests you and you feel like you really uh, maybe uh, want to go to and then reach out to the program director, reach out to the residents, reach out to the alumni and make yourself known, learn about the program through them and find out everything that you can. So um, I'm going to finish with that and uh, go to our next uh, topic. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hall. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Suleiman um, talking about diversity. Thank you. Awesome. Um, well, thank you for all for having me. So in my um, role as 
diversity and inclusion um, here at Northwestern. Um, there's a few things we have looked at in making sure that our environment has a culturally competent learning environment. And you know, with recent actions over the last two months, um, this is really a pertinent time for most programs to start talking about um, one, not only gender issues within orthopedics, but within race um, relations within orthopedics. Um, you know, when you do an away rotation, it really gives you the sense of what the cultural competency level of a program is within the residency program, as well as from the faculty level. Me personally, as a black woman, I was looking for a program that not only had women, um, but had trained um, other African American residents in the past, um, as well as their faculty. Um, and if they did not, was there a real effort into truly not only diversifying the program, but a program that is inclusive and equitable? Um, and, I, and it's an uncomfortable topic, um, especially now, um, but us as an orthopedic, subspecial, orthopedic specialty, um, our residency programs have to teach our residents um, how to understand our implicit biases and how that affects patient care. Um, you know, health disparities isn't an issue for primary care specialties. It's an issue for all surgical subspecialties. Um, so, you know, my advice when you're looking at diversity of a program, it's, it's not just looking at their website and seeing, you know, how many people of color, how many women are in the program, but what's the culture of the program? And so, you know, if during your interview, not a single person, whether it's in the introduction of the program or what's the core values of the program, if, if a program is not talking about diversity, inclusion, and equity, to me personally, it is a red flag. Um, in 2020, I think every program should be talking about it in ways to improve that culture um, and address the fact that orthopedics is behind from all aspects of gender and race. Um, and if it is the case, you know, what's the plan for the program moving forward to educate our residents um, on how to provide equitable health care? Um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Tish. I know she wanted to kind of highlight a couple of things you the mentions. Sorry. You're on I'm mute, Tish. My, yep, I figured that out. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so... Um, Thank you, Linda, uh, Dr. Suleiman, that was fantastic. You know, um, part of what we are doing at Anthem Dementias is not only the exposure um, of orthopedics, which is a fantastic field, despite all of these um, things that we're talking about, um, but it's also to give you as a female student or as a student of color, um, a um, inroads to how it works and to give you support and to give you a voice for, um, for how to address some of these very difficult topics. Um, race is difficult, gender is difficult, and it is all uncomfortable conversation, and, and that's okay. And so part of what we're here to do and help you is to navigate that. Also, um, Anthem Mentions will be very soon, um, um, launching a resident support program um, that will be a monthly um, program uh, with small groups and mentors to help you also navigate some of the landmines that happen in residency that you may or may not even realize are there. And so, because honestly, the goal is that we don't, we just don't want you to get into residency. We want you to graduate from residency. We want you to become an orthopedic surgeon. We want you to become a board certified orthopedic surgeon, not only because we need more of us out there and we need your help, um, but we want you to be successful. And so I think all of the women that are here tonight are here to support your path and to support your, um, your journey. And um, hopefully you will use us as resources for just that as well. So I'm sorry, my Wi-Fi cut me off. And so I may have missed what the actual question was, but I just, <laughs> I just fed off of Dr. Suleiman there. So that was it. That was it. <laughs> Can I just chime in? Can you hear me now? Yes. Right. Um, I just want to say that this was the first year that I had multiple students 
ask me about diversity in the program. And it definitely caught me off guard, but I was so happy that people felt comfortable, comfortable enough to ask the question, have you ever trained a person of color? If I'm the first person here, the second person here, the third person here, how are you gonna go about making me feel welcome and comfortable? And it was, I appreciated the question. So, mm -hmm. you know, I definitely would say that if it's a concern of yours and if you are interviewing at a program, it may not be that there isn't somebody there that looks like you out of, for a reason. It could just be because they've been trying and trying and trying and students just went elsewhere. So I would say, I would encourage people to ask the question if you want to ask it. And I would echo those comments that it's it's some of the questions that you've received because to some degree it's beyond diversity to actually feel welcomed and that you belong and that and that's what you need to be comfortable because this is a, it's going to be a busy five years to maintain your physical and mental health and your well-being you've got to feel like you are putting in those five years in a place where you're where you belong even if you are potentially the first a uh, female woman of the resident that the program has had, that doesn't mean that you still can't belong. So Monica, I think the next is going to be uh, your discussion on, on personal statements. Yeah, so I'm gonna be talking about the personal statement, which definitely can be a source of angst and many, many, many hours of going through it and trying to figure out what to write about. And I would, my philosophy, people have different philosophies and different takes on the personal statement. Um, I would say that, first of all, whatever you're going to write in your personal statement, be prepared to ha be talking about it. So if you are writing something in your personal statement about your spouse, your significant other, something that happened to you in, in your life, that all that is fair game if it's in your CV. So if you write about your kids, and they ask you about your kids, that is not an inappropriate or illegal question. So whatever you write in it, be prepared to talk about it. Um, my take on the personal statement is to make it be personal because your CV is gonna have your college career, your undergrad, I mean, your undergrad, your, your medical school, your high school, you know, not necessarily high school, but you know, if you played sports, your research, your grades, and the personal statement for me is something that should, show me or show program directors program something different about you that's going to make you stand out. So, you know, we actually looked at 400 of our past personal statements and about half of them had, you know, they person likes to work with their hands or they injured themselves or they were an athlete, things along those lines. If you want to talk about that stuff, by all means, talk about it, but then move it into a direction to give a little bit more insight as to who you are as a person. Because it's a good conversation piece of the personal statement and it lets people know about you. So that's my take. Anybody else? I am a big believer in the personal statement. And this year, more than any other year, it is that's all we have for many people. And um, really spending time on it. If you are at a medical school, you probably are close enough to a university or know someone who is in the English department. And that's what I did in medical school. Uh, I took my personal statement over and had help writing it. Uh, so um, I feel like it's a, it's a, it can make a very good, uh, it can help you. If you're careful with it, it's very well thought out. Uh, and so I would spend time on it uh, and, and make sure it really, I can't echo enough making it personal. Don't tell me why you, you know, orthopedic surgery is a wonderful field because it returns people to function and form. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I know what an orthopedic surgeon does. I want to know about you and why you want to be an orthopedic surgeon, who you are, who's influenced you, uh, and, and more about you through the personal statement. I would agree. And even simple things like spell check. Um, nothing gets more frustrating than seeing a lot of grammatical errors or misspellings or anything in the personal statement. And although that sounds like a small point, that gives us an idea of somebody's attention to detail. So I would, I would make sure that you do you spell check, and as Dr. Holt said, have someone who is an English major or is used to writing go through your personal statement. I would also recommend that you have people read your personal statement who know you. 
to make sure that your personal statement actually reflects who you are. When you're writing your personal statement, that's going to be the hardest thing that you have ever written. So as you're struggling with it, don't be surprised you're struggling with it. It's hard for everybody. It's hard to get your, your life, your career, your dreams, your aspirations down to one page. It's, you've spent your life getting up to this point, getting that onto one page is challenging. So that's the, the, the statement is where you can tell us about yourself. As Dr. Holt said, you wanna make it personal. Tell us why you are a fit for orthopedic surgery, what your personal interest is in orthopedic surgery. Use it to show us your accomplishments beyond what we can see on your CV, but don't oversell yourself. And that's where you need to have somebody read this who knows you, because yes, we want to know that you are awesome and you'll be a great orthopedic surgeon, but you got to be careful how much you oversell telling us that you wanna go into ortho because you're going to change the field is a lovely aspiration and hopefully you will change the field. But as a medical student coming into residency, that's kind of over, that's overshooting. So you wanna make sure that you don't oversell yourself. As women, we tend to have issues with imposter syndrome and we tend to undersell ourselves too. So just make sure that you're re reaching the right balance by having somebody else take a look at it. Um, so, so I would agree with everything that was said. I think this year there'll be perhaps even more attention to the personal statement um, because you, um, nobody has the opportunity for away rotations. And so that's going to be one of the main ways um, that outside institutions learn who you are. So um, as Dr. Templeman said, I would have somebody on a faculty mentor look at your personal statement. I would also have a close family member or a significant other look at it, somebody who knows you um, outside of just um, your medical education. And you may want to reach out to your local residency program director to see if they will read it. We have a lot of stuff going on now with COVID. This is not an easy time to be a program director because we have a lot of people we're trying to take care of. However, um, you may find program directors that are willing to take a look at it. I just, from a personal standpoint, I read most of the personal statements that come from students from our institution because I know what I'm looking for as a program director. And so I wanna make sure that, again, they're, they're, they're presenting themselves in the best light they can. I can't guarantee that the program director at your institution would be willing to do that, but you may find, if, if not, you may find a program director within this cohort of people or faculty from this cohort of people that we put together for these webinars that may be willing to take a look at your personal statements. I think Dr. Templeton just volunteered. <laughs> uh, I'm, 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 happy to, I'm happy to, too. I love personal statements, but really make sure it's only one page. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, yes. certainly. I think most of us would be willing to look at a personal statement. Um, I think it's going to be very interesting, not only this year because of COVID and the fact that there are limited sub eyes or no sub eyes, um, but starting next year, boards, I mean, you know, USMLE part one is going to be pass fail. So that's going to be an entirely new can of worms that we're opening and we're going to have to figure out how to navigate that. So your personal statement is also going to be incredibly important moving forward for those of you that are not just fourth years for if there's anybody here that's that's a third year or a second year. So it's going to be incredibly important that we um, have a way to tell who you are if we haven't been able to see you. And um, and we and we don't know, you know, where you sit on the um, uh, on the um, number scale anyway for a one day test, which I have my own personal beliefs about. But <laughs> fair. Um, so there'll be a slide at the end that has all of our emails, and um, definitely um, we're all here to help however we can. Um, I'll move to the next uh, topic and part of the application, which is letters of recommendation. Um, a program director in any given application year will see uh, nearly a thousand applications, um, and many of the applications will have similar board scores and clerkship grades and number of publications and extracurriculars. And so a great letter of recommendation, especially uh, in this year with no away rotations, can really make your applications stand out. Uh, a good letter of recommendation is going to tell who you are as a person um, and also what you're going to be like as a resident. So uh, considering that, it's very important uh, who you choose to write your letters and how you ask. 
Um, and at least equally as important as who you choose to write the letter is how well they know you. Um, so while uh, it may be very impressive to have a letter from a senior uh, professor or somebody who's well known in the field, if they don't know you well, that's going to definitely come across. And so if it's somebody who um, needs your CV to remember who you are, it's probably unlikely that they're gonna write you an exceptional letter of recommendation. Um, there's a paper in 2017 from Dr. Bill Levine and colleagues that says that the optimal person to ask for your letter um, is an academic orthopedic surgeon who you've worked with for more than two weeks. But that doesn't fit every uh, scenario. So if, you're, uh, if you've worked with an assistant professor um, for more than two years in an advisory capacity and they know you really well and you're debating between that person and a professor who you worked with on a rotation for two weeks, I would definitely go with the, the person who knows you better. Um, and then the next step is how you ask for that letter. And that's really important as well. Um, I feel really strongly that you should not ask for a letter of recommendation by email. I think you want to set up a meeting uh, with the faculty member, uh, ideally face-to-face, -face, uh, but during COVID, uh, Zoom is fine. Um, and you wanna ask that question, are you comfortable writing me a really good letter of recommendation? And very rarely will somebody tell you no, um, but if they do, you're better off um, because you definitely want somebody who's comfortable writing you a really good letter of recommendation. Um, and then once you're at that point, you, uh, when you sit down with your faculty mentor, um, hopefully you've put in the effort to develop good relationships. For those of you who are not applying this cycle, um, so for the MS ones and twos and threes, uh, this is a great opportunity to reach out to the orthopedic chairman or program director or medical student uh, clerkship director and set up a meeting and get to know them uh, because developing uh, and building relationships with your faculty mentors will absolutely serve you um, well in getting these good letters of recommendation from someone who knows you. Um, for the fours who are applying this year, uh, when you have that meeting with your uh, letter writers, uh, you want to let them know who you are as a person. Uh, you want to give them a chance to ask you questions. Um, and that's not a time to be modest, and that's not a time to downplay your accomplishments. Um, uh, you want them to write about you know, why you're going to be the you know, best next resident that they're going to have. Um, and then after you have your meeting about writing the letter, you want to make it easy for your letter writer. And so you want to provide a copy of your CV and uh, your personal statement, even if it's in a draft form. Um, and then any submission details, so submission deadline, submission links, and your ARAS number, um, just to facilitate the process. Um, and I think if you can, it's ideal to have uh, three of your letters or all of your letters be from an orthopedic surgeon. Um, but if you're at a medical school that doesn't have an academic orthopedic program, um, then I think it's probably even more important that the people who are writing your letters really know you well and that that comes across. Um, and then one topic that I think is loosely related to letters of recommendation, and then I'll ask other people's thoughts. Um, this year in this uh, unique application cycle, I think that that personal contact and um, people, ad your faculty mentors advocating for you um, may be even more important. And so you know, if you narrow, you have two to three programs that you are particularly interested, maybe based on the three L's that Dr. Holt mentioned or the places that you were going to do your OAs, I think it may be valuable to sit down with with your primary or closest faculty mentor um, and speak with them about possibly reaching out to advocate for you before the interview cycle, so at the time of the application process. Um, so it's yeah, just one perspective. Um, other thoughts on letters of recommendation? I think it's incredibly important that you ask someone if they are comfortable writing you a fantastic or an excellent letter. I actually have had one person for fellowship who told me that he didn't think it, that he could write me a good letter. And I found out later that it wasn't, I of course was very upset when he initially said that because I had done a fantastic job on his pediatric orthopedic rotation. I was going to apply for Peace Fellowship. But um, I found out later that he probably did me a favor by telling me he couldn't write me a letter because he was a terrible letter writer. Like he would say something like, it pains me to write this letter as much as it pains you to read it. 
And so I was like, oh my God, I'm really glad I didn't ask him. And I searched for somebody else who knew me just as well um, that was able to write me an excellent letter. So I think that's important um, to ask up front. And hopefully whoever you're asking is going to be truthful enough to tell you yes or no about whether they can write you a good letter or not. Yeah, I think you have to, uh, it helps when you present that and say, listen, if you don't feel like you know me well enough or you don't feel like you can write a, a really good letter, you know, I understand that and and kind of giving them an out. I've had medical students who, you know, work with me for a morning clinic and ask for a letter of recommendation. And I said, I, I think you want someone who can, who knows you, who can really write a great letter. And, uh, you know, if you're kind of given that, that feel and that advice and just say, thank you very much. And I certainly will. Um, I would also uh, say, and we had talked about this as a group earlier, that um, getting a letter from, from an orthopedic surgeon uh, is really important. Um, I find that far that trumps anyone else's uh, great letter of recommendation. I would agree because we know what an orthopedic surgeon is looking for in a residency candidate. So when they tell us that this is the best student with whom they've ever worked, or the, they're going to rank them high in their program, then we know what they're using to help evaluate the students because we all speak a similar language. Not to put down someone say in pediatrics, but if, you, if we have a faculty member in pediatrics that writes you an awesome letter, and this is the best student they've ever worked with, I don't know who they are, and maybe you're the first student they've worked with. So that doesn't really help put it in perspective. So yes, you really, really want to get letters from orthopedic surgeons. And I would also echo Dr. Laporte's comments about giving them your CV when they're going to when they're going to write your letter. Especially as a woman, I would highlight what what you have done that's on your CV. I would also highlight your board scores, especially if they're good. Because unfortunately that's another area of unconscious bias is that it's not unusual when we're getting letters about female applicants that we hear about how nice they are and their team players and both of those things are awesome to be, but that doesn't, that needs to be couched along with what are your abilities as, as a medical student, what are your technical abilities, what are your academics. For men, we hear a lot about how much they've achieved in academics and research. For women, we need to hear the same thing. And so we love people that are nice and team players, but it's gotta be the other stuff too. Um, and I know that two out of the three historically black college and universities, Meharry and Morehouse, don't have a home program. Um, and we know that. And I don't want students to think that just because of virtual rotation, there's no rotations essentially where most letters are coming from um, those away rotations. I think still getting at least one or two orthopedic surgery letters and then at, from your home institution, maybe another surgeon you've worked with, um, still speaks to us. And at least you know, your applications were aware of that, especially with um, not having any away rotations to take that opportunity. And this is really a wake up call to those of you that are first and second and third year medical students we're in reinforcing to you that it's really important for you to build a relationship with somebody, not just an AM morning clinic and then asking for a letter. So you, as a first and second and third year student, you have the capability now to set up a recurring conversation with mm -hmm. the orthopedic surgeon if you have one available. I do agree with Linda that there are programs that don't, and so we and we do know that. And so we ask that you um just attempt to at least if you can get one yes if you can get somebody to write you an amazing letter that may be tangentially related a sports medicine non-operative person may be kind of the next level of hierarchy um you know but but whatever it is you want it to be a good letter from whoever it is um because that's better than a mediocre or a warm letter from somebody that really doesn't know you I would echo Dr. Bradford's comments, get to know for the, the people that are not applying this year, get to know the faculty at your institution early. Um, talk with your program director at your institution. Are there ways that you can shadow people in the orthopedic department? OR is a lot of fun, but a, a clinic in my experience is a better shadowing experience for students because there's more time to teach, it's less stressful. 
plus the faculty get to see you without a mask, except maybe now during COVID, I guess we're all wearing masks, but otherwise they can see you and they can recognize your face. And so you're developing that relationship early then when you're doing your rotations as a third year, and then you're coming by as a fourth year talking about careers in orthopedics, the faculty know who you are and you become someone about whom they can write a really good letter. For those of you that are, are applying this year, it's still reaching out to faculty and getting to know them so they can write you a good letter. And research is always a good way to get to know somebody as well, if you don't have, uh, depending on the opportunity. Um, you know, if you want to spread your cast your net a little bit wider, meeting people, offering to do research, you need to do a good job if you do the research, but that is another avenue to really get to know someone and let them see uh, how you can work. Mm -hmm. Right. Pam, okay. I think you're, you're going to up. talk about interview tips. I'm up. I'm going to be talking about interviews, which I think as important as everything is that we have talked to up to this point, this is the area that's going to be the most different this year since interviews are going to be virtual. So some nuts and bolts to consider first. One is where you're going to do the interview. Um, I would talk with your school of medicine. Some schools are setting aside areas where you can do an interview. If not, I would find a, a place and start looking around for places where you can do interviews. Such, such things as noticing what the background is. Um, I've been doing, like all of us, have been doing a lot of Zoom meetings. For those of us that have been on Zoom meetings with me, there actually is more to my house than just what you're seeing in the background. But it's it's a relatively plain background, and I think it looks better than, uh, you know, having big pictures or something behind me. But everybody's different. Find if you if your school is not providing a place, then find a place where you're comfortable. Um, have a chair that you can sit in that's comfortable, a, 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 a desk or a table where the computer's at the appropriate height and where the background is good. If you're going to be doing the interviews at home and you have animals, I would make sure that they are not in the room with you, although they may, as if with my cats, they'd be clawing at the door to try to get in and that may cause more commotion. It's, it's cute when you see animals crawling around in the background, but not during an interview. Um, so I would find some, some other place for them to be. If you have young children, I would make some arrangements for someone to care for the children during the interview. Um, you want to make sure that you're doing the interview on a computer, not on your phone. That's uh, not going to give you enough perspective of, of the interview. I would also practice with your, your internet connection. Make sure that you're at a place where you have a good internet connection it's a reliable internet connection and that you understand the software of the system that's going to be used for the interview so that you know how to use the microphone, you know how to use the camera and make sure that you can be seen during this. So it's practice, practice, practice. Other things, um, what, what do you look like during the interview? What do you wear? Well, at least from the waist up, I would wear whatever it is you were gonna wear to the interview. Um, waist down, if you want to wear yoga pants, that's awesome because you're not going to see it. If that's what makes you comfortable, that's fine. But it's whatever you would have worn to the interview. Um, it, when we see people interview, and in, I don't know about the other, other people on this, on this call or this meeting, but it seems like all of our interviewees, regardless of gender, are wearing gray and black. And that's fine. If that's your jam, that's awesome. If you want to wear a different color, to stand out, that's fine too, but just make sure it's professional. So it's a jacket, a top, and jewelry, if you like jewelry that's not too ostentatious. Um, makeup is fine if you normally wear makeup. You don't have to, you're not, you're not being interviewed on TV, you're not in a movie, so you don't have to wear makeup if you think it makes you look better. If you're more comfortable in makeup, then please by all means do that, but it's not necessary hairstyles, whatever makes you comfortable and whatever looks professional. So you want to come across as professional, but you also want to be yourself. You don't want to try to uh, portray yourself as somebody that you're not. Um, you don't, so just wear whatever hairstyle is comfortable for you. During the interview itself, there are likely going to be a variety of different formats of interviews. It may be one-on-one, -on -one, it may be one student with a panel of faculty. That's what we're planning at our institution. But I would ask ahead of time 
what the what the format is for the interview because it's different if you are working virtually and there's one other person on the screen than if you have several people and you're trying to monitor everybody's questions so i would find out ahead of time what the platform is for the interview and then what the format is and how many faculty are going to to be in to be involved in the interview Again, it comes to practicing, and so I would recommend not only practicing with the format for the interview or the interview platform, but I would also practice answering questions. Again, this is where you, where you start recruiting uh, your family members, you start recruiting friends, maybe even your program director of your local program, if, if they're willing to help you with this, to go through some questions that are fairly routine, and you're probably going to be asked at some point by some program. One is, you know, why do you want to go into orthopedic surgery? Um, that is reflects what was in your personal statement. Make sure what you say reflects sort of what was in your personal statement, but use the interview to expound upon that. And what is it about orthopedics for you that makes this a career that you want? As was said earlier, we all know that orthopedics makes people better. If it didn't, that we probably wouldn't be in the field, but what in particular about you, your experience, your background. Did you have a sports injury? Did you have a mother with a uh, low impact fragility fracture of the hip? You know, what is it about orthopedics that floats your boat? Um, that's something that you really, although it seems like an easy question, really needs some soul searching because that is a question that you're going to be asked and we're going to be interested in, in, the, in your response to that. As was also said earlier, Whatever is in your personal statement, whatever's in your CV is fair game. So if you mention on your CV or note on your CV that you've done research, please know what the project was. Um, you are going to be asked, likely, what the goal of the project was, what it was you were trying to prove or disprove, as well as your role in that. As a student, you may have a huge role in a project, but you may also have just a minuscule role. You may be doing just a very, very small part of the project. You're still important to the project, otherwise it wouldn't be completed, but you need to know big picture, what was the goal of the research? And so you make sure that you are, are familiar with that. Um, you wanna bring up what are some of your unique experiences? Those are things that may be in your personal statement, but maybe not. What are the things that you bring to the table as a person, as a physician, as an orthopedic surgeon? What makes you different than everybody else? And I would say, especially if you are not in an institution or have not had a, a, the opportunity to do research or not much of it, or if your grades or board scores are good but not awesome and you're looking for that next leg up, what is it about you that allows you to show that you are a well-rounded person and what you can bring to the table that kind of helps supplement what you may be lacking in terms of board scores and research experience. You also are likely going to be asked at some point uh, what it is you're looking for in a program. Not an uncommon question, especially when you're interviewing not at your home program and especially if you're interviewing somewhere outside of the geographic region of your medical school. So find, know something about the program where you're interviewing. Uh, learn something a little bit about the faculty. Um, learn something about what the emphasis of the program is. So when you are interviewing with that program, we know that you're interested in, in us enough that you've taken the time to find out something about us or our program. Um, I would say from my experience, having applicants say they want to come to a program because you get to operate early. I'm thrilled that you want to operate. You wouldn't, if you didn't, if you didn't want to operate, you wouldn't go into orthopedic surgery. That in and of itself is not enough to tell us why you like a particular program. I would also be careful about, you know, if you're doing a one-on-one -on -one interview with an individual faculty member, telling them that you want to go to that program because you want to do what they do. Maybe you do, but I can't count the number of applicants that have told me they want to do orthopedic oncology. If so, we would never need another orthopedic oncologist again for decades. If you do, that's great, but back it up. Why do you want to go? What's your experience with that? So I'd be a little careful about if you're one-on-one -on -one with an interview telling the, the faculty member that you want to go into their subspecialty. 
if you do and it and it's really you and you're being honest and upfront with what you want to do then back it up with something about why you want to go into that this is all about projecting who you are and let us seeing the best side of you but really being authentic in who you are i guess my last comment is as you're describing yourself be very very careful about using the word just i'm just like excuse me i'm just a medical student it takes a lot of work as you know to be to to be a medical student especially to graduate from medical school there is no just about it when you're explaining so don't try to put down what your accomplishments are by saying just because you do have accomplishments it's a little challenging as a as a, as a woman to try to um, get across your accomplishments virtually because we do have issues with imposter syndrome we do have issues with stereotype perception where we don't think we're good enough and we think the rest of the world doesn't think that we're good enough, but you are or you wouldn't be in this position. And so really make sure that you are telling us what you've done, what your accomplishments are, why you're a good fit with orthopedics, why you're a good fit with a specific program, and be very definitive in that and really stand up for who you are and show us who you are. The other thing that I would recommend again is the whole practicing thing is try to come up with a 30 second and three minute description of who you are because one of the first things people are going to ask is tell us something about yourself mm -hmm. don't just come off the, don't don't just come up with something off the top of your head with that practice that write it down if you need to practice it in front of somebody else just as you're having them look at your personal statement practice that to allow them to see who you are so to demonstrate what the and i would do both the 30 second and the three minute because the 30 second may be all you have time for. You may do that and you may get looks and the, that they want more. So you wanna make sure you've got the, the, the more stuff ready to go. So to show you what we mean by the 30 second description, we're gonna go around with faculty and we're gonna give the 30 second of who we are. And I'll start off, I'm Dr. Kim Templeton, I'm professor of orthopedic surgery at the University of Kansas in Kansas City. I specialize in oncology and I'm Vice Chair of uh, Diversity and Equity within our department. Although I'm an orthopedic surgeon, uh, one of my passions is working in the area of, of diversity and equity, which some people don't see the connection with orthopedics, but Dr. Silliman definitely will. Um, I work in the area of diversity and equity from the standpoint of belonging and how that intersects with physician well-being. Next, Dr. Laporte, put your next on my screen. <laughs> okay, um, I had uh, two cents about the um, interview as well. Um, do your homework about the programs that you're interviewing at, and uh, even though it's a virtual format, they're probably gonna ask you, do you have a question about the program? So even if you've had the chance to ask your questions, always have a question prepared in your back pocket that you can ask if they ask you that, so you seem interested, so you are interested. Sorry, so my 30 second uh, spiel. Um, I am a professor of orthopedic surgery at Johns Hopkins, specializing in hand and upper extremity surgery. In addition to taking care of patients and hands, I'm passionate about resident and student education and mentoring, and I've served as residency program director for over 10 years. I've had the privilege of serving on the orthopedic residency review committee, and I think it's very important uh, to increase diversity in the field of orthopedic surgery uh, to better reflect our patient population. And I'm a proud member of RJOS and the uh, J. Robert Gladden Orthopedic Society, working towards that goal. Dr. Holt. I, uh, my uh, interview tip is to uh, always answer a question. The worst answer to a question I ever get is, I don't know. The, uh, an interview is about you. I don't know about you. So if we ask what your favorite book is, or if you were to take a book to a desert island or any question about you, please come up with something. Um, there's no, often not a right or wrong answer. Sometimes we're just looking about how you think and can you think on your feet. Uh, my 30 second ish spiel is my name is Ginger Holt. I am a professor and vice chair of orthopedic surgery at Vanderbilt Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee, Music City, USA. I've been at Vanderbilt for 17 years, uh, 22 if you count my time here as a resident. And I've been the residency program director and orthopedic oncology fellowship director for 11 years. I specialize in musculoskeletal oncology and adult reconstruction. 
And I don't think you can find a case big enough for me. I love the big, the bad, and the worst of all. Uh, but more than that, uh, my biggest passion really is our residents and uh, resident education. I think they would tell you that too. Uh, my nickname from them is Mama Bear. Uh, and I take care of them, protect them, and would do that for any resident who came in my program. Dr. Suleiman. You're muted. I just wanted to mention um, one more addition to the interview day. Um, I frequently get asked by women of color, uh, medical students interviewing is, you know, how should I wear my hair? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a, a lot of people wouldn't think about that on the interview day, but there's implicit bias as well as explicit bias on how um, culturally women of color are perceived based off of how they wear their hair, whether um, women are wearing their natural hair, which most women are doing now. I'll give you just my own personal experience. Um, I typically, if I'm giving a podium presentation or um, interview, um, I typically do straighten my hair and wear my hair down. But that is what I wear as, as what's comfortable for me. It is naturally curly, um, but in interview settings, I typically like to wear my hair down um, and slick back. But again, my biggest advice is just wearing your hair as you uh, and just being yourself and not worrying about um, what the interviewer is going to perceive. Um, I'll tell you a story of one interview location I went to where um, a social the night before, um, I had the wife of a resident at the time um, that was talking to me about the program actually reach out, touch my hair and say, your hair is really nice. Um, is it yours? Um, and that was eight years ago. Please don't do that ever. <laughs> no. You're you're muted again, Linda. Oh, I think her Wi-Fi is okay. Uh -uh. uh oh. Dr. Suleiman, we can't hear you. I'm sure you're saying and amazing things. Yes, yes. Um, I am an orthopedic surgeon at Northwestern. Um, I'm the director of diversity and inclusion for graduate medical education the last um, two years, and I'm now the assistant dean of medical education with a primary focus in um, bias reduction and how we educate our residents, fellows, and medical students. Um, not only through training, um, but with advocacy and health equity with the Chicago community. Um, we, as an institution, um, eliminated step one score from all programs as a screening tool um, because it's a biased measure. And mm -hmm. so, you know, my biggest advice is look for programs that are looking ahead into the future and how we can make education for our residents and fellows better. I'm going to piggyback off of Dr. Suleiman only because I think that um, the elephant in the room hair thing and what is considered professional is actually a very important topic, especially for women of color. I think the one thing that you said, Dr. Templeton, that um, I think was incredibly important is that you said, be your authentic self. And that for many of us includes curly hair that is big and is bold. And I, when I used to, um, I used to help um, orthopedic um, residents um, and brand new attending study for boards. And when we talked about the uh, oral boards, we talked about, I used to tell people, you wanna fit in, you wanna blend in, you wanna make your hair straight, you want the black suit just like everybody else is wearing. And in the past three to four years, I have personally for myself and for others realized that if that's not how you roll, then you would be incredibly uncomfortable. And this is a day that you are supposed to be the most confident that you can be. And if that means that your hair is curly and your hair is down, then that's how you show up. Um, I think that that confidence exudes from you if you feel good and that's incredibly important. And I think honestly, that if a program doesn't want you or is concerned about you because your hair is curly, then that is not the program for you. And so I think it's an important thing to know early on 
if if that's thing. I think it's funny, both Dr. Suleiman and I have our hair in ponytails today, but normally my hair would be big and out and down and curly and because that's that's who I am. And so I think that that's an important thing. And if that is your authentic self, then you show up as that authentic self because that will exude the most confidence. Um, I kind of gave my 30 second elevator speech before, but I'll do it again. I'm Dr. Letitia Bradford. I'm a general orthopedic surgeon. Uh, I am currently doing locum tenens work around the country in mostly underserved areas. I have devoted the, my career mostly to um, diversity in medicine and um, diversity and quality of care to underserved areas. Um, I worked 10 years in a remote uh, hospital in uh, California where I was the only orthopedic surgeon for a hundred mile radius and so I worked with the underserved and the uninsured and um, that is really my focus and I am currently the executive director of Nth Dimensions working to improve and increase the pipeline of diversity into orthopedics, radiology, physical therapy, and dermatology. I think Dr. Laporte, who is that? Is that everybody? I think my, Dr. Kogan. Yes, Dr. Kogan. Yeah. Oh, I'll talk fast. I'm a fast talker and just to leave time for questions. But uh, my name is Monica Kogan. I am, uh, I do pediatric orthopedic surgery. I am at Rush University Medical Center. I'm also the Associate uh, Chief Medical Officer for Surgical Services there. And uh, my passion is resident education, uh, promoting diversity, equity. Um, and that's my 15 second speech. Right. And so that just was we can get to the questions. So hopefully that demonstrated to, to the, the people that we have on this webinar. It's a very brief discussion of who you are, what you're doing, and what your interests are. Just you get that down in 30 seconds with again the additional material if you if they want more. Perfect. Thank you. Um I think uh Dr. Ross from uh, Vanderbilt has been collecting the questions and I would like to answer as many of your questions as we can. Yeah, um, so I tried to answer some of them while we were talking, um, but one really good one that came up that I think um, would be helpful if you guys um, kind of talked about was how to gauge diversity and inclusion in a virtual interview, since you won't be able to be at that location and you know talk to people face to face. That I think is where you do your background research. Every department has a website, some websites better than others. But at least get an idea of the faculty members and the residents currently in the program. That doesn't give you the feeling of the culture of the program, but it's at least a place to start. But I would love input from, from others in terms of how you can dig into that a little bit more in depth. I, I'm gonna, from, from my standpoint, the point that was made earlier is to ask the question. I really appreciate it. My face sheet is completely white and I have uh, recruited hard uh, African-American students, men, women, and the um, when the question comes up, I'm very happy to talk about it and let people know, you know, our stance. And so I don't at all mind the question. I think, if, again, if you can't ask the question and you don't feel comfortable asking the question, that may not be the right program for you. But I would ask the question and I welcome the question because I really want to talk about it. Uh, I feel a little awkward bringing it up, but I do uh, because I want people to know that we care. We are for inclusion, for diversity. And um, I kind of beg, you know, really ask, ask and recruit. Yeah, really, I agree. It's not, clearly it's not working. I could use some help, but. <laughs> I I would ask um, at their interviews, but I would also ask the residents in the program and the points of contact because they'll have a different perspective. I think you get something different from each person that you ask and um, that I think that gives you some insight to the program. And like Dr. Templeton said, looking at the website, looking at the history of the program um, gives you that background, but talking to the people that are in the program and the leadership and seeing what they're asking, what are their goals? What are they doing to um, increase or address diversity? I think is really important. I would also say that, you know, now with social media and with these websites, you have access to the residents in the program mm -hmm. um, and you can reach out to the residents. You can also reach out. So if there are no women, let's, let's say there were no women in the rush program, you can reach out to residents in another program and ask, did anybody rotate at this program? Can you give me some insight on this program? 
because even though we may not have women, women may have chosen to go someplace else for whatever reason, but it is a very female friendly program. Women have the potential to thrive there, whatever it is. But you can you, you now have all these mechanisms at your disposal and, and use them, use the resources. And I, I agree. And I and I would use the resources available to you from the programs. I would be very leery of some of the resources that are available via social media or other means, the Google Docs and the things that are out there that are describing people's issues or concerns with programs. Understand that there is no input from departments or faculty or residents into those and so those comments may be real and they may be because somebody's griping about a program so i'd be cautious with using materials that are out there that are not coming from a reputable source either the programs or there'll be things coming out soon from the what's called a council of orthopedic residency directors that material will be coming out those are things that have been vetted and it's actually going to be more information and better information than you get from some of the other sites that are currently available. Um, some other some other questions that came up um, are regarding uh, step one scores um, and also like what is a what is a good board score? Um, how do you know how competitive you are for certain programs? Um, can you guys talk to that? A little bit. So I can say um, that you can look on the um, ARS site and it gives you statistics of what's the average step one score. But I, um, just like Dr. Suleiman mentioned, I think more and more programs are not looking at step one, um, not only as a screening, but as a selection tool. So I think there's less attention to it. That said, you know, what's the average for orthopedic? Um, folks who match, I think it's 245, it goes up a little bit each year, um, but it's a holistic application review process. And, you know, each program is a little bit different, but at our program, um, your application is going to be reviewed regardless. I would say to know if you're competitive, talk to your program director or your medical uh, clerkship director, and they should tell you where you stand and um, how competitive you are. If you don't have somebody at your program that you can go to to ask, I'm happy to you know, give you my two cents. Uh, my email's up on the, all of our emails are up on the screen. Um, I think you have to have a perspective, but I wouldn't hinge it all on your step one score. There's a lot more to your application. Yeah, and I think now more than ever, having uh, a mentor, an advocate, and someone who would call on your behalf, uh, which we, you know, having a small group and having a group of women who are very uh, happy to do that, to meet you, to Zoom with you, and then, you know, to talk, uh, help find a, a, you know, a spot for you or maybe in their own program. Um, now is the time to network, whether you guys network amongst yourselves, but use um, every resource that you can. Uh, if your board score is a little bit low and you think you may get cut, you, you really have to talk to a lot of people about their perspective on programs uh, and get as much good advice as you can. But I think we all realize that everybody can have a bad day. And so it's hard to hinge the rest of your career on one day where maybe you didn't didn't perform as well as you thought you would. But you are more than a score. You have your your experiences, your research, your your clerkships, and your other work in orthopedic surgery. And so if your board score is a little bit low, that's where your personal statement, your letters of recommendation, as Dr. Holt mentioned, the networking, if you're interviewed, that's all of the stuff that's going to help supplement a score that may be not as great as you were anticipating. Uh, I often say to people, for better or worse, people want diversity and women add diversity. So, um, you know, be yourself and um, ride that wave. Take every opportunity you get and grab it and don't feel bad about it. Another um, question that I think is kind of important um, is asking about maternity leave and having a child during residency. Should people bring that up if they're thinking about it? Um, is it a good idea to do that? Is um, or what, what kind of what are your thoughts regarding that? I would look first on the website for the department where you're interviewing to see what their policies are. Everybody's going to have a policy on this. 
I would personally recommend that you reach out to the program coordinator to ask what the policies are, if they've ever had a resident who's pregnant, how well that has fared. I would be a little reluctant to bring that up during the interview process, understanding that every program is going to give you time off. Every program has a policy for this. I'm not sure I would use your interview time to bring that up. The interview is about getting your, your personality across what it is that you, you would bring to a program, your interest in the program. Um, if you do get pregnant during residency, there will be ways of, of addressing that and making sure that you have time off. But I'd welcome other comments. I think that you find, uh, I think you find that there are programs that you're comfortable to talk about that with, and it may not be on the interview day. If you really like a program and you really want to know more about that program, you may want to reach out to the residents. You may have found someone that you really connected with that you feel comfortable to talk with um, using alumni. So, you know, it's a pretty safe spot to call that program to coordinator and ask if you can talk to some former residents. And I think uh, for Dr. Tumble, that's a great suggestion. Uh, that the program coordinator is a great resource. If our program coordinator likes somebody, we do consider them more strongly. If she doesn't, we we put it at their application in the trash. And they are a wonderful source of information and a very safe zone to ask uh, questions like that. Yeah, I would agree that, and the program coordinator can direct you to a, re, a faculty member who you can talk to. Like if somebody called my program coordinator, they put them in touch with me. We've had a number of residents who've had children during uh, residency. Um, but I do also agree that the maternity policy is usually up on the website. If you can't find it, um, I would ask outside of the interview. Um, but it's something, you know, it's very fair to want to know about that beforehand. I would dare say they aren't the same you know pretty standard yeah i i personally would not um ask about the return and leave policy most institutions um from an acgme standpoint will be posted on the graduate medical education website of that institution because it's a, a gme policy it's not a specific departmental policy um, but the American Board of Medical Specialties just announced that starting this July, if you're in a residency program longer than two years, you can take six weeks of leave, um, parental or medical, once during training without using vacation time and without extending training. Um, and that was announced from the American Board of Medical Specialties. So um, that's across the board. So I think it's just one less question that you would have to bring up at this point. And I'll add to that, the ABOS, which is the American Board of Orthopedic Surgeons, last year, um, under the direction or the input from uh, Ann Van Hees, who's a, a woman program director, um, changed the policy. It used to be that you had to work uh, 46 weeks a year um, for all five years to sit for boards. And now they have changed that to be averaged over the five years. So if you needed to or wanted to take eight or 10 or 12 weeks off um, around maternity, you can do that and still sit for your boards on time. So it's a very important question. It's just you need to kind of figure out ways of asking it rather than using your interview time and an interview time that's going to be probably relatively short to go into that discussion. And it may also be the faculty with whom you're interviewing don't have a clue what their policy is. And so they're, they may not be able to help you. You know, in general, at a job interview, um, you may not necessarily ask that up front anyway. Um, you know, you're going to kind of more stealthily try to find that information. And it's not that you're necessarily being sneaky about it, but you just don't necessarily want to have all your intentions out there up front. Um, and, um, and in the end, you're going to finish and you'll figure out how to work that in if that is what happens. There are ways, you know, residents take, do a research year and you try to do it during that time. People do it during fellowship, people do it during, so it's it's a conversation that you eventually should have with someone, but maybe not during the interview. Yeah, I think we have time for uh, like maybe two more questions, but then please reach out to us if your question wasn't answered. Um, any of us are happy to um, email or speak with you all. And we um, do uh, a session will that will be coming up in the near future with residents uh, from our program so you can ask them questions too another question that is 
pretty appropriate and I think will apply to a couple people um, is couples matching. How do people navigate that and is it appropriate to bring it up during an interview? Actually, it'll be your application. And so the program director that's reviewed the application will know that you are couples matching, at least in our institution. The program director for the significant other to whom someone where they're applying will get in touch with us to let us know that there's a that, that this is a couples match. So we'll already know and that'll already be flagged on your application. So last year I will say that with the medical students that I met with, this was a constant question. And I honestly think that it was on that Google Doc that people were talking about it because they would say to me, they would ask me a question like, have you ever matched anybody who couples matched? I just thought it was a strange question because it's not, we don't decide that by the couples match. I think that there was some misinformation out there that was going on. So we don't decide whether the people match. We don't take somebody depending on a couples match or not. You rank them and then it's air, it's the, the era system that matches everybody up. I hope that makes sense, but. Yeah, I mean, to Dr. Templeton's point, the, we know from the get-go uh, that, that, you know, you filter people. We filter people by couples match to see if we need to be considering other programs. We talk to the program director in that program. The, the problem I find that will happen is that uh, internal medicine, PEDS, and some of the other programs uh, throw, out applicate, throw out interviews much earlier than we do. And I get the question, hey, um, either from the program or from an applicant who will interview that says, uh, my significant other got an interview at your program. Do I have a chance? Because they don't want to come to interview if I'm not going to get an interview. Now, some people say, I'm, you know, I'm, we're going to separate if we have to, which is telling. But uh, that's the dilemma I get into is if I, and, and we try to quickly do a review and do an assessment to determine uh, if that's going to happen. But usually I'm a little bit uh, later in offering interviews and just try to assure them we are looking through, you know, looking through the process and and uh, assessing that. Um, we usually hope is a strength for someone that if their significant other, Vanderbilt's a great place, very strong uh, other programs, and that it may be an opportunity to recruit someone if their significant other uh, is really happy with medicine peds or whatever else they're matching into, uh, that we may, may be able to get someone you know, potentially couldn't otherwise get. I would echo that, you know, Hopkins, we have other great programs. Um, oddly, this year, three of our six new interns uh, couples matched. That's a very high percentage. Um, but I think it's uh, absolutely fine to bring it up because I, I think like Dr. Halter or Dr. Templin mentioned, we'll sometimes reach out to the other um, program director, whether it's PEDS or OBGYN or um, ODO, um, and, uh, you know, let them know, um, just like you may get the reach out from them, that we, you know, we interviewed this significant other and we, you know, we would advocate for for this person. So it can be to your advantage to bring it up as well. I don't think it's a detriment at all. It's not a surprise. Yeah. The only one in my experience where it's a little bit challenging is when it's a two ortho couple that is trying to match. So the both are going into orthopedics. I don't see that often, but when that is the case, um, that can be a little challenging having a couple in the same program. I think it helps you if you are looking at at cities that have multiple program options or, or program options that are within close proximity to each other. Um, I have no experience with couples matching, but but that is what I've been told kind of over the years. If you you know have a city like Chicago, for instance, that has more than one orthopedic program, um, then that may be a better option for you than trying to match at one specific program with your significant other. And hopefully it's a, a husband or a wife and not just a boyfriend, so. Yeah, the uh, boyfriend, girlfriend doesn't, or you know, not engaged is a, it can be a little bit difficult. We we matched uh, a young man into our program who then broke up and you know created some interesting situations. But okay, last question. Um, and I think this is kind of a hard one. Um, how do you navigate the inappropriate questions like, are you married? Are you planning on having kids, et cetera, during an interview? And I feel like usually these come from the men interviewers more than the women. So what is an appropriate response to the, these kind of questions? 
I would say first, remember anything that's in your personal statement or your CV is fair game. So if it's in there, they can be it can be asked. So if you don't want to talk about it, I wouldn't put it in there, nor would I bring it up on your own during the interview because then it again turns into fair game. But yes, there are inappropriate questions. I would, and I think Dr. Bradford, if you have comments on how to deal with inappropriate questions. Those are tough. Um, we've we've had this conversation actually a little bit earlier um, when we were talking amongst ourselves, and it's difficult. I think that some of us. I think it depends. I think part of it depends on how bad you want to go to that program, honestly, and whether it is a confrontation that you have at the moment. Whether it is so there are wars and there are battles, and so you need to decide which which one it is. Um, and certainly they are not technically allowed to ask you things like sexual orientation, um, family planning. So if you're going to, if you have kids, um, even things right now, like political affiliation kind of things are not supposed to ask. And so, you know, it, it's hard. And I think that Dr. Kogan and I were talking earlier about how we deflected those questions when we were asked them, um, made a joke, made light of them, tried not to basically answer it directly. Um, it's tough. I remember I um, went to interview in Philadelphia and before I went into the interview, I was told by someone, wow, we're really surprised to see you here because literally just last week, our chairman said, uh, women and blacks shouldn't be in orthopedics. And I was like, oh, and so I was, I was obviously completely flabbergasted and I was, and I didn't, you know, how do you respond to that? And so I think that I, at the time I, I deflected the question basically and tried not to take it head on. Obviously I didn't rank that program very high based on that chairman. Um, but I think it's tough. I, I'm happy to listen to what others have to say um, regarding those type of questions. I mean, you want to know how people stand, but you don't want it to be at the detriment of you getting a spot. Right. That I would also add that if you don't have to answer any question that you're not comfortable answering. Now, that may mean that you're not going to go to that program, but you may not want to go to that program if they ask you a question that's truly inappropriate or uncomfortable like that. A la deflect and defer to Dr. Kogan, who has written a nice paper on um, inappropriate and uh, illegal interview questions. But I would I, you know, I would like to empower you that if you think somebody's asked you something that they shouldn't ask you, you don't need to answer it. Yeah, I agree with that. You know, the one thing is that, um, you know, having gone through this, we I'm sure we all were asked inappropriate questions um, at the time. And, you know, some of the programs, are just not the programs for you, you know. So if they are asking that que those questions, if they're asking those questions on their best day, when they are supposed to be showing themselves in the best light, you can only imagine what it's going to be like for the rest of the five years. So I mean, I would just take it under advisement and just, you know, answer the question if you want to answer the question. Don't answer the question if you want. Don't answer the question deflect it, make a joke out of it, and then just use it as a data point as to what type of program it is. And if you're not comfortable answering the question, then say, I'm not comfortable answering the question. You may not want to go to the point of saying it's illegal and you can't ask me that, and that may be a little bit far, but at least if you're not comfortable and, and it's you can't figure out a way to deflect it in the moment, then just tell them you're not comfortable answering the question. But I would agree with with Dr. Kogan and Dr. Laporte, if they're going to ask you those questions on a good day, they may not want to rank that program. There was a good uh, response on social media. Not a big social media person, but I said, you know, if they ask a question like that, you can say, "What did you mean? What do you mean by that?" And kind of, you know, make the person think about it again. Do they want to ask it to you a second time? Which That's they great. may well do. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many people double down on those. So. <laughs> and you're confirmed. Um, so on that sunny I mean, to me, that's so telling of a, a program. I mean, I certainly interviewed in a different era uh, than now, but I think the one of the biggest things, and, I, and you hate it, that you can't, you guys can't go interview at places because I think the gut feeling that you get for a place is really 
uh, you know, kind of the final thing. And those are the things that really, when you leave a program, just say that just wasn't the right place for me. That absolutely wasn't a place I'm going to uh, feel comfortable. We even, we go over with faculty before we interview again, remember, you know, these are things you can ask. These are things you can't ask. Let's just make sure we stay in, in, in the rules. And if a program can't even, can't even do that and kind of stay within the, uh, the lane lines, then, you know, it just may not be the right place for you. And there are plenty of great places. So, you know, if there's one off that you don't want to consider, there are 186 other really good orthopedic programs. So um, that's not a deal breaker. Um, so I appreciate everyone staying in uh, till uh, 20 plus minutes over. Um, we really appreciate you all joining us tonight. Thank you so much to the faculty. Um, as a number of people have mentioned, there's going to be a series of webinars. Um, for women interested in orthopedic surgery. The next one uh, will be in about a month and we'll send out a notification and it will be with a group of women orthopedic residents from across the country uh, with a forum for you to network, meet these women orthopedic residents and ask your questions again in a you know safe, comfortable environment. Um, and then about a month after that, um, we're going to set up to have mock virtual interviews. I think mock interviews are really important. And I think in this year with virtual interviews, it's going to be even more so. And so um, we will um, provide a resource to um, do your practice virtual interviews. And we look forward to seeing you uh, hopefully uh, throughout the next few months. And please reach out with any questions. And thank you to everyone. Have a great night. Thanks, everyone. We'll thank talk you. To you. Good night. Bye -bye. Thank you. Good night.